Welcome to Simply Caroline, a podcast dedicated to women empowerment where we will discuss a bunch of different subjects such as life, parenting, love, business, money, relationships, healing, recovery, addiction, entrepreneurship, and so much more. A podcast I'll do my best to keep simple, fun, and relatable and bring you tools to help you better your life. So thank you for being here. And here's your host, myself, Caroline Blanchard. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us again this week. I have like a subject that I'm very passionate about, a subject that I there's so much to learn on and that I need to learn a lot on still. So today we're having Laura Evans and we're going to talk about climate change and sustainability. Hi, Laura. Hi, how are you doing, Caroline? I'm doing well. Thank you. So, um, you know, I was thinking when I invited you, like, how come I didn't talk about that before? But mm. it's really because it's such a vast subject. And at the same time, it's a very, you know, it could be resumed in a few sentences. And at the same time, we could talk about it the whole day. Let's yeah. talk about climate change. Yeah, sure. Um, so I actually, yeah, climate change is it's a thing that continues to happen and it is ramping up over time, but really it's it's a little hard to honestly put our um, minds around a lot of times because the climate is so big and it's so vast and it, and it does change, right? But it is about the speed of things and the cause of it is really industrialization. So, you know, just over time, we've been burning fossil fuels and we've been using the earth's resources to make, um, yeah, industrial products for ourselves. And that has just really sped up um, all kinds of pollution. But climate change to me is the thing that sort of encapsulates it all, you know, like, cause I actually, I do care a lot about climate change. Um, but I honestly, when I'm facing it as an individual, I try to focus on like water pollution and air pollution and where our food is coming from because sometimes, yeah, when I can focus on more material pieces of climate change, I'm able to show up and understand it a little bit better. So I have a background in environmental law and uh, recently wrote a book. So I, I am constantly trying to communicate with people about climate change and the environment and yeah, how we treat the earth. So. Yes. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, I will have quite a few questions to ask you on climate change, mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to have your background first. So how long have you been, you know, really crusading for, because you've dedicated basically your career and your whole life. Yeah, so I went to college to study biology, and then I changed to natural resources in like 2005. So I've been learning about natural resources policy and management, yeah, since 2005. And then I, after college, I moved to law school and, or I'm sorry, I moved to law school. That's funny. I moved to Texas to go to law school. Yeah. And um, when I was in law school, I just studied everything about environmental law that I possibly could. And then when I got, cause I knew I wanted to be an environmental lawyer. I wanted to take what I had studied in college and then apply it to law because I just had seen in college so many different environmental problems. And that is where I learned about climate change. And to be honest, in 2005, it was framed to me as a problem for my grandchildren. And so I really just didn't think about it like a whole lot. But as I have, yeah, I practiced a law at a law firm doing federal wildlife law and the Endangered Species Act specifically. And so I really came up against a lot of the ways that humans and wildlife and the land really can butt heads with each other and come into conflict. And so, yeah, I just continue. And then I, I did leave the practice of law. Um, I had an anxiety attack at work and ended up leaving a few weeks later. It really wasn't for me. And so just because environmental law hasn't been for me, I've done a lot of work since then being an environmental planner here in Buffalo, New York. I worked for a nonprofit organization for a while doing more like climate justice and sustainability work. And yeah, I'm, I make a podcast called the Keeping Things Alive podcast. So 
I'm just constantly trying to see, yeah, how I can show up and really be here like for the earth and other people. The other interesting thing about my journey is when I really started, it was like, oh, I love, you know, being outside and I love the earth and animals. But as I've like gone through this, like, yeah, 15 ish plus uh, journey, it's really come to be a lot about people and public health and just all the ways that like we're so connected to the earth. So yeah, like the earth is, you know, struggling. Yeah, climate change is raging and stuff, but so are we. And so I think that that's been one of my biggest lessons. Um, That's so interesting. And you're right. You know, we're talking about climate change, but uh, the society in general is all changing. And Mm -hmm. I like how you just said that now it clicks something in my brain. Like, yes, it is connected. You know, we're connected to the earth. Uh, Mm -hmm. So let's just go back to, you said you left your practice because you had an anxiety attack. What happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that is something I describe probably the best in the book, but it has come, it's a story that is important because it really did flip everything, but it was towards the end of the year, you know, the winter and the holidays. And I was really in a law firm, you have to have billable hour requirements. So, you know, I was really pushing to get in all of my billable hours by the end of the year. I was writing a paper. I had a lot of family stuff going on with people in town and there was a big flu season that year. So I I got the flu um, really badly and uh, was based, I had to just totally quit work for a week. I mean, it was totally out. And I really do feel like I say it it did change my consciousness in many ways. And I I came back just wanting to live my life differently and yeah, saw a therapist and very soon after uh, left, just totally put in my two weeks notice and didn't fully know what I was going to do yet. Um, That was a little jarring, but I did find another job working for the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and, you know, continued to try to practice law in different ways um, and ultimately ended up leaving fully. But I guess what really just, I think, I forget how I described in the book exactly, but it was just like, I couldn't just keep working so hard for something that it felt like it wasn't going anywhere, you know, like it was just, it wasn't, I was talking about environmental law there because you were telling me something in pre-interview that, you know, I, I don't think that we really know what environmental law is. We think it's to protect the environment, but you were telling me that it's not Mm. always the case. Right. Yeah. And that's actually, that's the main purpose of my my book right there. And that is how I, I, it even kind of shows how I went into it thinking it would be about protecting law. We do have the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And those types of laws have done some things to stop pollution, but Mm -hmm. they've also permitted pollution. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's just a lot there. It was a system that was set up in the 60s and 70s that hasn't been like revamped you know we don't have the political power or like the political will to change make those types of changes and so it's a really yeah antiquated system that it does it doesn't always show it rarely rarely shows up to really protect the environment in a way that we need to and I think you know just as climate change like effects keep showing up in bigger weather patterns and just yeah weird weather and all that stuff it come it's just a little bit harder to like ignore Um, And so, yeah, we don't have a climate change law, you know, like all the laws that we're working on, yeah, were passed a long time ago, and we don't, we don't have that. And so even last year, the Supreme Court reversed some stuff that the, the Environmental Protection Agency did, and it was because, you know, they didn't have direct, a direct law to follow, you know, so people are trying, but it it is really hard. So I, the book that I wrote um, is it's a nonfiction book that really tries to explain this environmental law system as basic as possible and how it's set up through my story. Um, And then I, so basically every chapter I summarize a different environmental law that I was working with at the time. And then I explain, yeah, like my experiences working in that particular um, job or field. And yeah, it, environmental law, it, it can be broken up into three categories. I mean, I do, I have a whole chapter called Environmental Law 101 that just sort of breaks it down as high, as much as I can. And I think I, you know, I really spent a lot of time to make it as accessible, the whole book, but really that chapter is accessible to as many people as possible. 
And it's really broken up into like pollution law, you know, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, but then land use law. So how we use the land, like how we manage our forests, how we make trails, how we, yeah, public parks and beaches. So what we do with the land. And then there's another piece called natural law, which is not written in the books, but, you know, nature and science, the earth is just going to be a certain way, like based on, you know, the inputs you put into it. So the quote I, um, there's a, um, a Native American uh, man named Owen Lyons, and he said, you can't negotiate with a beetle. And hmm. I really like that is sort of what environmental law comes down to, which is that you do have this like natural law that you can't negotiate with. So and it's stronger than us. Yeah, exactly. It and it doesn't listen. It, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's crazy that, you know, for me, as I was telling you in pre-interview, I don't watch the news and I don't right. read the news. And I know that it it sounds, you know, sometimes I may sound a bit ignorant, but first of all, let me tell you that anything that is super important, my mom calls me or my kids <laughs> tell me, or <laughs> there's yeah. always someone that will tell me. So mm -hmm. I'm not really missing out on anything, but I, I am missing out on the negativity. And for me, I had to do that. Because, um, you know, when I had my kids, it was creating such a huge anxiety for me, thinking mm -hmm. about what world did I put them in? And, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I didn't study environment. I'm just like, <clears throat> I probably know the average of what the average person knows. But, um, you know, the one thing that comes to mind is that for 2000 years, the 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 earth went one way and then in the last 20 it's just like it's going downhill and I'm like I don't want to see in my lifetime you mm -hmm. know everything finishing and what about my kids and what about their kids and it is um it does give a sense of panic of thinking mm -hmm. is there really a, an end approaching and I find it so unfortunate because we are so so smart and skilled and mm -hmm. all of this that for me, you know, watching what's going on is frustrating because yeah. there's clearly a lack of um, proper decisions. Mm -hmm. It's not because we don't have the resources or the knowledge. It's really, yeah. it's a choice. Yeah, I agree with you. And I definitely cut down on the news a lot. I think I have like a email news alert that I pay attention to and then cut it off mostly, but I have been going to the gym lately and it's on all the time now. Right. And so that is really difficult for me. And then also I, I've just seen, and I've, you know, I have some friends that have worked in local news and it is very much designed to create fear. So I, you know, I say in the book, like all is not lost and it's not too late. I, I really do believe that like, yeah, people are a part of the earth and even the COVID uh, pandemic, like the first couple, the first month of quarantine or whatever, just how quickly things can change and for the better, you know, for the worse and for the better. And so I really do believe that, you know, there has to be really big like systems changes. So I don't think it's right for people to like shame others or feel bad that they didn't recycle or whatever. But I do think that individual stuff does actually matter. So and just really basic stuff like, you know, I'm here in Buffalo, New York, and we just had that big blizzard and, you know, there wasn't any electricity for three days. And I was able to cook food on my like gas stove. Um, but, you know, I'm really I, I really believe in cooking for myself and being able to do that garden. So I just to me, it's like in this book, I really do feel like I'm trying to come at it from a very different perspective. But it really is that like everything is connected. And the, I think the more we pay attention to things, they grow. But I do agree with you that the, the news isn't the place uh, to get the information. Um, I think going outside would, would be better. But yeah, like trying to find some like minded people. And that's constantly what I'm trying to do is communicate and collaborate with others. But it is it is hard because this is really difficult information and the day to day life can really uh, get in the way. <laughs> Yeah, and it is a reality, and I'm not saying to ignore it. Uh, you right. know, I do everything that I can, and on my end, the only thing I don't have now is like my house is not solar powered, and right. my car is not electric a hundred percent yet. 
but uh because that too there's so many different school of thoughts and people telling me like do you know how much a battery is um you know polluting mm -hmm. and blah blah and you'll have to change it in 10 years so it's even worse so I don't know yeah. anymore so I'm just like I'm gonna keep driving what I'm driving for now <laughs> until yeah. someone gives me proofs that um you know I should right. do something else, but the rest, it's like, you know, we have to do our part and, and do what we can and, you know, reduce consumption and all of these things. And mm -hmm. I actually see like, even in my daughter, who's 22, she is a big, um, she'll buy her clothes secondhand. She'll buy her mm -hmm. stuff secondhand. She's like, mom, there's no need to buy things new. Um, right. I, you know, I'm, I'm impressed because that's, the mentality more of the younger generation i'm not saying all of them they all want right their own, of course but you know the the idea of reusing is way more present in their mind than it was in ours um yeah but like on a day-to-day -day basis you know we're we're a society that consumes so much that i'm like oh my goodness mm -hmm. <laughs> but so what you know if i would ask you and i'm really putting you on the spot now and maybe it's in your book because mm -hmm. i haven't read it yet but what if I ask you like the five things that everyone should absolutely do? Oh, wow. Um, okay. Well, I would say cook for yourself is like number one um, with like, yeah, really real food. And then I think also having a small garden, even if it's just a couple of herbs and a pot that you cook with. Um, I think having that connection between plants and your food uh, and being outside of a, a grocery store and is like, it's really important. Um, I think also getting outside um, regularly, which I need to take my own advice right now um, and do that. But like, just, yeah, on a regular Get a basis, getting out. I know my, my <laughs> dog is really old, so she doesn't need to go out as much. Anymore. Yeah. Well, me, um, they're not yeah. giving me a choice. If, uh, if I don't go out, it's worse than I, whatever. It's, it's a little nightmare. I know. So. I know. I, yep need to get a more active dog. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think those are three things. Um, and then yeah, finding, finding a way to get information outside of mainstream news, I think would be really good. Um, I, I really like, there's a group called movement generation out of Berkeley, California, that just has a lot of really good educational resources about climate change and climate justice and resilience. So and yeah, I think also, you know, it's very tied together, but just being like prepared for a natural disaster that that is based on your your place. You know, I think there were so many people and then getting to know your neighbors. So there was just a lot of people in the blizzard right now that just, you know, they weren't prepared like with enough food in the house or enough blankets. It had been really warm like all year. I mean, we had a snowstorm a few weeks before, but yeah, I think just having that kind of preparedness with your family is important. And then I don't know what number I'm at yet, but I would say talking about it, like just communicating, like even how you feel about it, like with other people and just talking about it, because it is kind of this silent sort of thing that, you know, that's why I wrote the book, you know, Silent Seasons. Like I've been silent about this my whole time. I'm just kind of keeping my head down and doing my work. Um, but it's on a, that, you know, yeah. on that, you're so right, because we don't, it's almost like if we don't talk about it, it's just going to stop. Let's just, yeah. not, <laughs> let's not talk about the elephant in the room. You right, know? right. Yeah, that's, and that, that is like climate change and, and other pieces of life too. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I definitely, I have these like sustainability themes in the book and it's, communication, collaboration, accountability, and then also anti-competition. That was something I kind of came out with at the end of the writing process at the end of the book, because I just kept coming up with like going to school and being graded on a curve. Um, I talk about my childhood being a swimmer uh, and competitive swimming and just this constant like trying to be the best and like get the most is like, it's a really unsustainable like way to be on the earth. Um, yeah true true which probably pushes us to consume even more because mm -hmm. you always need to have the latest be better mm -hmm. you know all of this yeah um, and then the, the businesses they're competing to make the best thing so you know the even the businesses that lose out they've you know created a lot too so yeah it's hard <laughs> 
So I'm going to ask you the question that probably you don't want to hear. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to know the answer, but how bad is it really? Um, I'm going to answer that like a lawyer. It depends. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, I really, you know, I think I, someone told me like a while ago that like, that like it's things aren't just on this like uphill trajectory like we just think that like the way things are going is just this constant like escalation at the same rate and so that's where I you know things are are not good they are really bad especially um I mean you know you're you and I are both in the Great Lakes bioregion which I think is one of the best places to be in this age of climate change um but <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of people around the world that are, yeah, losing, losing homes and land and islands. And it is, it's a, and it's connected to all of the strife that we're seeing in our society at large. So I, in that way, um, it, I mean, you could look at, it could be like really bad. I also do have a lot of hope in like the younger generations and even my generation and older ones for our ability to change. Um, so I have a lot of faith in women too. I think that, you know, we've been silenced like our whole, you know, millennia. And so I really do see a lot more courage and speaking up right now. So I actually do have a lot of hope and faith in, in it being like not that bad, but it does require like such like sh huge like paradigm shifts in the way that we all show up like with each other and with the earth. So I just you know, I, I don't think another thing is like, we're just fed a lot of like apocalyptic movies that things like happen really fast and it all just goes down on during a weekend. And yeah. it's like, I don't, don't want to be the last that. one. <laughs> I don't believe that though. I think it's like, yeah. it's a, it's a slower situation. Um, and it, and it does allow us to have time to, cor you know, to correct and like to do something different. So yeah, I, I don't know. I, I hope that so according to <laughs> yeah. no it does and yeah. i mean you know what i don't think anyway that there's one right answer to that yeah. question there's probably different variants of the same answer right. um but according to you it's still um salvageable i mean i don't think it's salvageable for our current like lifestyles but i think I don't think we're all going to go extinct and people will have to move to the moon. You know, I, I do think that like, but, you know, collaborating, communicate, like just our, our, our way of, yeah, buying and selling and being consumers and kind of, yeah, passive participants. Like I, I do think that that it will be over in my lifetime. Um, but I don't think that like, we're all, I don't think we're just all going to die, you know, like yeah. the movie don't look up. Um, and which is really the movie don't look up on netflix is kind of it's an asteroid uh movie but it does kind of have an allegory to climate change and you know in the middle she just kind of yells like we're all gonna die you know she just yells in the middle of the um media thing and you know because it's an asteroid right um but and i i think that there are a lot of people and you know you could i i do grieve for like the way that i grew up you know like in the 80s and the 90s like as a kid, like, I think, you know, that is gone, but I do believe that, you know, there is a place, like, I just, yeah, I think that there's a lot of life and a lot of hope and a lot of ways that we can all like be on this planet together. So, yeah. And that's a big, <clears throat> a big part that we learn in your book, how to keep yeah. alive and how to, you know, um, all come together, like you say, because I, you know, I said it so often to my kids, sometimes who will say, well, what does it change if I do this? Mm -hmm. like, well, if we're 8 billions, and we all say that, you know, it does change something. So the little things in your life that you can change, you do. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to touch on one thing before, you know, closing the interview, because it's super interesting. You are a planner, and you were telling me that in, um, well, I'll let you say what to, I'll let you explain what you do. But you were also telling me that it's a male predominant world, the environment. And mm. I was just like, what? Because for me, as the average person, I always thought it was a female dominant world, because mm. most of the activists are women. Mm -hmm. but most of people who make the decisions 
are men and I don't want to yeah. start a debate here of like... I know well right <laughs> I, well I I I have to say this is based on my like personal experience of yeah working and not necessarily like statistics that I've like come across but I will say that when I went to college and when I went to law school it was like 50 50 gender and then when I went to the law firm um there were some women that I was working with as associates but all of our bosses were men um then when I went to the um to work for the Texas uh, Commission on Environmental Quality I, I did have I did have female bosses, but still like above them were men. And then I think the government was a little bit more uh, even. But once I, I did do environmental consulting as well, like remotely, um, and that was all, all men. And so, yeah, I just think that, you know, as a lot of, I mean, I haven't kept track of it a lot, but like, you know, and just like law firm culture and like perf just engineering a lot of this is like science uh yeah land use and then construction too um it is just it tends to be a lot more male heavy um and yeah with planning that is um there's the national environmental policy act which requires people to um evaluate the impacts of federal projects like if something's going to impact the environment there has to be a whole plan and process and assessment written about what the environmental impacts are. And so that's like my job right now is to write things like that. And then, yeah, so before a project happens to be writing about what the land is like, the characteristics, what the project's like, and then potential impacts. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's very similar to, you know, other other fields like law and things, you know, as like women get older, a lot of them, you know, get married and have kids and just change careers. And I mean, I'm someone who's changed careers without those things happening. But um, yeah, I just, what I have noticed a lot is just this very, it's more, yeah, corporate government um, male. So spaces. basically <laughs> women, women, we need to get into that even more because <laughs> you know, we're going to make things change, but mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, they, they're, I think with, yeah, activism and community organizing, and there are so many women speaking up and, and there are women that are, are working in these spaces too, but yeah, I think really showing up and speaking up about, yeah, what's going on and, and not being silent is really important. And it's, it's hard, like still, like, you know, with my job right now, I, I don't get to pick the clients and you know I do the best that I can um but it is it's so a very me, interesting world is there yeah. sometimes that it happened that you said it will have a negative impact and the project was abandoned um because I know that these are just like um <clears throat> formalities but I'm not sure if <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I feel like I, that's like, you know, I think it depends on who you ask. I'd, I don't know. Um, I don't think that I've ever been in a position where I've had to say like no impact when it is, but there's definitely like ways that you can phrase things that make things sound like better or worse or, you know, but I, I think at my stage of the planning process, it is mostly just information. So I, you know, for example, like I worked on one where they were changing a old airport into um, like sort of, sort of this like agriculture support facility. So I, you know, I wrote, oh, this is like a totally dark place. But when this comes on, like there will be lights and stuff. So, you know, just explaining that now you'll go from a totally dark place to something that'll have light pollution. So what they do with that information is beyond me, know. you know, but I, I do get to write what I see and, you know, what I, you know, like, okay, yeah, this place there, oh, there is like a lot of noise here already or, you know, something like that. So it just, it depends on the current circumstances, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm pretty clear about it in the book is that I, I wrote the book because the environmental law system, it doesn't have the answers. Hmm. Interesting. So we can get your book on Amazon and Nobles. It's well, called it many people. Oh, 
It's, Sorry, it, no, it's called okay. silent, silent season. You yeah, did go up a little, so I. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so, so it's silent seasons chasing sustainability through the law. Awesome. Well, Laura Evans, it was such a pleasure to have you, and I feel like we could, you know, we could have 53 podcasts on that. Because oh yeah. So many questions that I would like to ask, and you yeah. know, it can go so many different ways. But like, mm -hmm. let's, let's summarize this by saying, let's stay positive and do our, our share and, you know, not feed into the negative and get your book. Yeah, right. And then it's going to give a really good different perspective as well. So what would you leave people with like this one last thing? Um, I, think, I, I just keep wanting to say this to people and that is that clarity is kindness. I know that that seems a little like doesn't make sense with the sustainability and stuff, but when it comes to like, just being really honest about what's going on, like with ourselves and like with the earth and like, yeah, if something isn't working, like being clear about, oh, this isn't working. Like that's actually like a kind thing instead of you know, being dishonest or, or hiding behind things. So I'm just encouraging people to really speak their truths. And yeah, if something is up or like, you know, you didn't expect it to be that way, like to really, yeah, talk to someone about it and, and share how you feel. Thank you so yeah. much, Laura. It was a pleasure having you. And to everyone who was here, thank you for being here again this week. I will put all of Laura's information with the podcast, but where can people find you? Yeah, I have a website called keepingthingsalive.org. And then I make a podcast called the Keeping Things Alive podcast. So that's on Instagram and Facebook. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. Yep. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You Bye. too.